Thank you. I'm sure many people will be interested uh, in Rubberbank's adventures in the cloud. Uh, for now, we have Christian Fekete from, uh, uh, from uh, Solo.io. Uh, give it up for Christian, please. Uh, sorry, we're, we're having a little problem with this buzz sound. Uh, it, it's not in the room, it's in your ears. <laughs> <coughs> it's being worked out and uh, it will, uh, sorry for the overall loss. All right, good morning everyone. Uh, this presentation will be about eBPF. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are already familiar with eBPF. Yes, if you could raise your hand please. Oh, it, nearly everyone. Are there any eBPF experts in the audience maybe? There are some lights coming in, but I ca cannot see any. Uh, last time I gave this talk, that was at Cube Huddle uh, in Edinburgh last, at the end of last uh, year, and there were lots of eBPF talks there. And um, yeah, that was almost an eBPF summit because there were multiple talks. Uh, but here it's, uh, I didn't see that many. So uh, hopefully. Uh, this will be something interesting for you, especially if you are just starting out with eBPF or you want to uh, find a new way to experiment with eBPF itself. So first, some introduction. Uh, my name is Christian Fekete. I'm a field engineer at Solo.io. Uh, you can find the contact information uh, um, of me uh, on this slide. The company itself, we are an application networking company founded not that long ago. Uh, we are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the US, uh, but we have multiple locations. We are all working remotely uh, around the globe. Uh, we are doing mostly uh, application uh, networking related stuff, but that's a quite extensive field. So we are nowadays uh, covering uh, multiple uh, layers in the application networking stack, starting from the kernel and ending uh, at the um, regular traditional application networking uh, layer, application layer, that is layer seven in the OCI model. Um, our products are um, open core enterprise application model, but we also have a few open source, uh, completely open source uh, projects as well. For example, Bumblebee that, uh, that I will talk about uh, quite soon. We have many happy customers, we are well funded, we are also hiring, so if this is something inter interesting for you, um, please reach out. Oh, and uh, come and say hi uh, at our booth and uh, enter to win a drone. So first, my background, because this presentation has a title of uh, how I like to, how I get to uh, know and love eBPF itself. So it makes sense to include uh, a little bit of background uh, of me first. Uh, as you can see, I was mostly a systems infra infra infrastructure, DevOps, SRE, platform engineer, my professional life. I was mostly doing the same thing uh, in all of my uh, positions, previous positions, but you can see the trend how the uh, name of the position changed over the years. My main focus is and was observability uh, most of the time, so I designed and operated observability solutions for video streaming clusters, um, hundreds of VMs in uh, on-premise data centers across the globe, and these were serving millions of users. I was an SRE at a um, um, password manager company that's quite famous nowadays. Uh, yeah, maybe you can uh, guess the name. Uh, and I was also operating uh, clusters uh, running Kubernetes and uh, Istio. eBPF is quite a hot topic nowadays, as you uh, also know. Uh, it also has a steep learning curve. And fast forward to last April when I joined Solo.io, I got to uh, get familiar with this technology. Uh, I was able to make some contribution to our Bumblebee uh, project and to, to the uh, BCC uh, framework as well which, uh, as you will see, is basically the, uh, uh, the, the first generation of uh, eBPF-based tools uh, out there. I was also able to create a developing eBPF application workshop. Uh, if you go to solo.io and uh, choose the um, events page, you can uh, find uh, workshops that we uh, frequently do, and there are some eBPF-specific uh, workshops there as well. So, 
first, let's see what eBPF is. Uh, eBPF is basically a flexible, safe, and fast way to inject custom logic into the kernel. Um, the origins are dating back to the days of uh, TCP dump. If you are uh, around for a long time, you might have already used TCP dump to, to troubleshoot networking issues. That was using that was using originally uh, BPF, which is uh, predecessor of uh, of eBPF. There are multiple use cases uh, regarding eBPF. These can be sorted into four main families. Uh, for example, security, tracing, profiling, networking, observability, monitoring. Security is quite trivial because eBPF, as you might already know, is based on kernel events. So you are able to uh, track actual syscalls happening in your, in your system. Tracing and profiling is also uh, quite important because you can get a, a unified overview of your actual uh, process uh, running in the user space, and uh, you can get some information about this process from the kernel space. There are multiple profiler tools currently uh, that are quite popular. These are nowadays the, m the more modern ones are based on eBPF as well, for example, Parker. Uh, networking use case, mm, you can do, uh, for example, layer four load balancing and other uh, similar um, things with eBPF. Um, again, Mm, we are at the kernel level, so this can be quite performant and uh, and safe to do so. So that's that's another uh, great use case. For example, Cilium uh, can come to mind if you are familiar with uh, that open source project. And the last family is uh, observability and monitoring, and uh, this is that I will cover in this talk. Uh, this is also a quite nice uh, area because uh, eBPF can solve observability challenges that cannot really be solved otherwise. This diagram is probably my favorite uh, eBPF diagram because it's, it's quite simple, but still it's, I think, the best way to understand what eBPF is and how it works uh, in your system. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, the user program. On the right, you can see the kernel space program. When you have an eBPF program, uh, you have to um, take into consideration both sides because the user space program is the one that uh, the user will interact with. This will uh, display the statistics, for example, if you are getting some statistics out of, out of the kernel. And the kernel side uh, logic is basically where your actual eBPF um, logic is. So first, it looks like uh, that the uh, user program is responsible for generating the BPF bytecode. This is just some lifecycle management for your actual uh, BPF code. But uh, this also has to uh, be done by the, by the user space program. Then after the BPF uh, bytecode is generated, it will load into the kernel. And as I mentioned, eBPF is, is safe. There's a verifier in the on the kernel side, and uh, you are only able to run custom logic into, uh, on, on in your kernel if uh, it passed the verifier. It's fixed. <laughs> <laughs> So after uh, the verifier is passed, uh, you have that BPF uh, rectangle there. That's your actual BPF logic. Uh, eBPF BPF is basically event-based. So you can uh, specify multiple events, K probes, U probes, trace points uh, in your kernel. And when uh, these points are being reached in the kernel, you can trigger your custom logic, uh, which is the BPF rectangle there. The last piece in the on the kernel side uh, are maps. Maps is a way to exchange data between kernel space and user space. So once you have your data that you are interested in in the kernel, you have to populate your um, various BPF maps uh, in the, on the kernel side. And uh, from these maps, you will be able to read uh, the data from the user program. And this is basically how you, for example, visualize uh, this data. OK, so now we know that what eBPF is, uh, to some extent. We know that, uh, but why it's, why it's, uh, why it's uh, important? As I mentioned, it's important because it can be a solution to impossible tasks and scaling issues. Scaling issues, I mentioned that uh, when I was talking about um, network, the networking um, use case category. eBPF is quite per performant. It's, it's in the kernel. Um, for example, you can uh, do some 
uh, really effective uh, copy operations uh, that way uh, between your uh, network interfaces. So if you are operating at a really large scale um, regarding networking, for example, you are a cloud provider, it might make sense to, to look into eBPF. It can be also a solution for other uh, impossible tasks, for example, observability related ones. Um, if there are some SREs here, uh, I guess you had some hard time to catch uh, out of memory exceptions in Kubernetes clusters because there are very, there are a few error prone ways to, to catch those. If you want to export those as uh, Prometheus metrics, then uh, you, have an, um, my, you might have an even harder time because there are no real exporters. Uh, you have to either uh, mount the Docker socket uh, someplace and uh, get data from there. The C advisor doesn't really cover all of the um, use cases of uh, out of memory exceptions, so it's quite hard to get it right. Uh, for example, this is a great uh, example where eBPF can help. And it's important because there are multiple personas, for example, application developers, SREs, DevOps engineers, and network operators who could benefit from this. In this presentation, I will focus on the SRE DevOps engineer parts because uh, back in the day, I was also one. Okay, why eBPF is scary? Because some can think that it's scary because uh, basically it's the kernel. And uh, that, that just doesn't have a quite nice ring to it. Nowadays, everyone is um, spinning up new uh, web applications, microservices in Kubernetes clusters. Uh, everyone is parsing JSON. Uh, you might have a, a Kafka queue in the middle of your stack, but basically most of the engineers nowadays are not quite used to uh, do some low-level systems engineering work. So when they hear that uh, ABPF is something related to, to kernel side, to kernel, um, it, it can be scary. EBPS can be also scary because of the lack of the documentation. I'm not saying that there's no documentation. There are some. It's getting better and better. Uh, but uh, you have to either seek out arcane blog posts by various um, EBPF uh, authors, or you have to check out the, um, the kernel mailing lists, and the user experience is, is not, that, not that great. Most of the people, again, are not really used to uh, check out uh, the kernel mailing list if, if you want to um, troubleshoot a, a bug in your uh, JSON parser web application. EBPF can be also scary because people don't really know where they can start to get familiar with it. There are lots of emerging do tools. There's a new EBPF-based tool every other week, so it can be quite daunting to, to, to find the, the right one where, it, where uh, you can get familiar with this technology. And uh, I mentioned it already, it's the kernel, and I think that this is the, uh, this is the, the thing that, that can be the scariest of all. Let's take a look at the BPF landscape. On the slide, you can see uh, the application uh, landscape of, of eBPF. This uh, logo collection is from the end of last week when I last uh, gave this presentation. I was thinking about updating it with the new logos, but it was also quite hard to uh, get these <laughs> on this slide, so I decided not to. There are a few uh, new tools uh, out there, but as you can see, it's a, it's a quite extensive landscape. So again, it can be quite hard uh, where to start with um, getting familiar with this technology. To make it simpler, let's uh, focus on observability. And for observability, uh, we can follow the advice of Brandon Gregg. Some of you might, might have heard of him. He was, uh, he is a great contributor, one of the biggest contributors to the eBPF uh, ecosystem. Uh, this quote means that you should not reinvent the wheel uh, all the time. You should not uh, start from scratch. You should not program your way to um, everything. If there are tools available, let's just use them because people spend hard hours to um, get to the point where uh, those tools uh, are, 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 um, are working properly and uh, we should really benefit from uh, using those in the first place. On the slide, you can see uh, the, the BCC, uh, a screenshot of BCC. There are multiple, uh, basically, the. Uh, multiple layers uh, are here, and there are some uh, BCC eBPF tools um, attached to 
all these uh, layers. So for example, if you want to troubleshoot, uh, let's say, um, system libraries, then for example, QSnoop can be a good solution to, um, to get started um, finding um, performance issues or, or troubleshoot issues. Then there are multiple other uh, programs targeting different areas. This is basically a GitHub repository, so you can go to github.com uh, and find a business repository, and uh, you should you should find all these uh, all these traditional BCC tools in the in the tools folder. If you want to run these, uh, you have to do it like this. First, you write a single uh, Python program, and that single Python program will contain the user space program I was talking about, that's, uh, that's written in Python, and the kernel space program, that's written in C. Uh, but how is that possible? How can two languages be in a single program? It, it's possible because the C program is basically a string. And uh, yes, this is one of the reasons why uh, eBPF can be hard to, hard to uh, start with. You can see a screenshot here. Uh, this is actually the Umkiller uh, troubleshooting tool. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, BPF code uh, written in C inside the Python program. That's, this was the traditional way to get started with eBPF. Then during execution, BCC will call Clang LLVM and perform a uh, header lookup to know where the certain points in, in the kernel are. Um, Clang, and, uh, Clang LLVM and the kernel headers have to be present on the target machine where you would uh, execute your program. Then you have to compile your uh, code at runtime, but this can be quite problematic because let's say you are operating, um, let's say VMs uh, in production, and uh, you don't like to underutilize uh, these VMs, so let's say these VMs are consuming, uh, I don't know, 70% of the available resources, for example, CPU or memory, and if you, let's say you want to troubleshoot something, so for example, try to catch um, out of memory sessions. So we go SSH into the machine, uh, deploy the script. You have Clang LLVM there, that's quite huge. You have the kernel headers available, but you have to compile your program. And you have a virtual machine that is basically consuming the proper amount of resources. But if you compile your uh, traditional BCC code on that production machine, the SRE teams will be at your door, door, uh, at your door um, in a few seconds because those machines can easily uh, tip over because you are operating at the, at the desired um, resource utilization and now you are performing a very resource heavy operation. So it's, it, it might not be a good fit for, for production use cases. There is a better way to do this, and this is by following the BPF core uh, methodology. B core means uh, compile once, run everywhere. For this, uh, mm, you have to have the BTF type information available. This is usually done by having a VM Linux.h header file available on your system. Uh, this will make sure that you can run this everywhere. You will still use Clang as the compiler and the libpf uh, user space loader linker library. Uh, and if you have all these things together, uh, you are on the route to create portable uh, and better, more modern uh, eBPF programs. The kernel and the user space code in this case are both written in C, uh, which is great, so no more Python, no more um, injecting a code as, uh, as a C, as, uh, as a string. And you can even compile it uh, in advance. So after that, you don't need to have Clang uh, to be available on the target machine. You can just compile it in advance, ship to the target machine where you want to execute it, and uh, as long as the um, requirements are met, uh, you can easily run uh, an eBPF code uh, in a quite efficient manner on a production system. But we can do even better than this. Uh, you could only, it's also possible to focus on uh, only on the kernel space program. As you would imagine, the kernel space program is where the really exciting and interesting uh, stuff is. Uh, the user space is basically just plumping. You have to manage the life cycle of, uh, of loading the code, then cleaning up, then visualizing the data. That's not something that's, uh, that's very interesting. So, um, 
focusing on the kernel space program can be, can be uh, much more interesting. So back to the original question, where to start to learn eBPF? Uh, the answer can be, for example, with the Bumblebee project, which is an open source uh, project by, by Solo.io. You can go to bumblebee.io or uh, find the repository uh, under the Solo.io organization. Basically, um, it's fully open source. There are multiple um, examples there, so it's a great way to, to get started with eBPF. But Bumblebee is. Bumblebee can help you to build, run, and distribute eBPF programs as OCI-compatible uh, images, and it can even expose these um, events as uh, Prometheus-compatible metrics, which is quite nice because you most probably already have Prometheus, so it's quite trivial to uh, hook it uh, into Prometheus and visualize your, your data that way. And if you are talking about the observability use case, it's uh, also quite trivial to use the uh, de facto standards. Um, it's working like um, taking the existing libpf kernel space code and uh, generating the user space uh, code for you without even uh, knowing what uh, that user space code uh, will be. And we also wanted to focus on the user experience and the developer experience. So uh, with Bumblebee, you have a Docker-like experience meaning you can use basically very similar comments than that you would use with Docker. For example, you can do be build, be run, be push, uh, to push the images, to pull the images, to, to build the OCI images uh, for, uh, with your code. And, uh, and uh, that's basically a really nice way to distribute these uh, programs as well. You can see a very short video of Bumblebee in action. You can see an example. It's a C file. That's the kernel space logic. That's all you need. After you have the file, you can do something like B build and use the local file there. After that, the image is built. You can push it into a local or remote registry. After it's pushed, you can just run it. And uh, it even has uh, a user interface like this if you don't want to uh, expose, the, um, expose the metrics uh, and just for developing, local developing, you just want to see uh, what the output uh, will be. Um, basically, for uh, this, uh, it's, it's quite nice because you can use the, if you go to the BCC repository, you can find the lib, uh, lib uh, LibEPF uh, tools folder inside this uh, repository. And there uh, you find uh, most of the time two files per tool. And these files are basically rewritten to use the core principle, which is quite nice. These are the more modern um, equivalent of the traditional tools. And you can uh, um, take examples from this folder and uh, port these into Bumblebee. For this, currently, uh, you only have to um, take care of uh, a single thing, and that is you have to have compatible uh, map types uh, with, uh, with Bumblebee. Currently, only hash map and ring buffer is supported. So there are a few tools that are using uh, perf buffer. That was um, a traditional uh, map type. You have to um, port that to ring buffer first, but after that, you can basically just pull it into um, Bumblebee and your code will work and you have Prometheus metrics with the exposed data. On this slide, you can see a few differences between pair buffer and ring buffer. Uh, one of them is using um, buffers per CPU, the other one is using a share buffer. There are performance differences. The event ordering is, uh, is much better. The developer experience is also much better. There's a reserve submit API to make sure that you can uh, write more, uh, uh, write better code. Um, the requirements are to have a fairly new Linux version, but most of the, I think most of the cloud providers are already uh, shipping Linux versions uh, newer than this. So it's, it, these are not uh, really uh, hard requirements. I would have a demo, but uh, I will skip this. Uh, please find me if you are interested in a live demo. I can do it uh, at our booth or um, somewhere around here. Uh, I will um, just skip this to, to uh, go to the finishing uh, slides. You can see the roadmap for uh, Bumblebee here. We are trying to keep up to date with libpf. There's an active development going on with libpf tools. Um, there's, for example, a new compact layer that can make it, uh, that can abstract away 
the the actual map type that you would use. So for example, if you are using, if you are running your code on an older Linux where uh, only perf buffer, the, the older map type is supported, then it will fall back on that. If a, if a newer uh, one, for example, ring buffer is available, it will use that. So these are quite nice improvements and we are uh, aiming to uh, keep uh, Bumblebee updated to, to be able to uh, use these changes. We are also working on tighter Kubernetes integration, for example, to get correlation with pod names uh, easier. And there's an operator work already in progress, basically that can enable you to have Bumblebee deployed into Kubernetes clusters as a daemon set. Uh, and uh, that daemon set can load the OCI images into itself and expose the data um, as, it, as it goes along. Currently it's already possible to use Bumblebee with um, uh, with Kubernetes clusters. For that, you just have to package it as a daemon set. Uh, the, the original CLI tool can be packaged as, as a daemon set and it's, and, and it's working quite well. If you're interested in a demo, please find, uh, find us at our booth and uh, I can show it to you. We are also planning to add new map types. We are also planning to have logging integration so you can, for example, um, log all the events that you would want to um, expose and you can inject these logs, uh, ingest these logs into your uh, logging platform. We are, uh, don't currently support histogram met metrics types uh, for the events, we just only support gauges and counters, but uh, histogram is something we are also working on and we are uh, all the time working on adding new uh, libpf examples to the Bumblebee uh, repository. And you are also all welcomed to, to contribute to, to those examples. My key takeaways from learning uh, eBPF with Bumblebee uh, are, can be seen here. Basically, uh, now that I know that eBPF is really a game changer, uh, focusing on only the kernel space is fun. It's much better than doing all the plumbing with the user space code. Integration is key because, for example, for observability, it's really nice to have integration with, with Prometheus right away. And uh, we are just getting started and uh, we would like to um, we would like to all of you to benefit from the uh, eBPF ecosystem. So feel free to um, take Bumblebee for a ride and please reach out if you have further questions. You can join our Slack and come to our booth to enter to win a drone. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Christian. I, before, you, before you get off, uh, I. I actually have a question that okay. is not eBPF. Uh, do you know when ambient mesh will be made production ready? Excellent question. Ambient just got merged upstream last week, I think, or maybe this week. Uh, oh no, I think it was last week. And uh, I have to double check it, but I think the next Istio version, Istio 1.18, will include this profile. So you can already. Um, it's, it's basically, yeah, you can, if you go to the uh, Istio uh, repository, you can find the ambient specific part of the readme. You can uh, download the artifact there if you, if you want to try it out. You can also check out the academy.io website where we have a virtual environment running. Um, it's a free course. You can take ambient for a ride there as well. But I think the next uh, Istio release will already include ambient as a profile, so that's, uh, that's also a quite nice way to uh, experiment with it. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Christian? Hey, uh, nice presentation. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, uh, my question is, um, uh, can we monitor uh, from in the observability space of eBPF, uh, can we only see L3, L4 level metrics, or we can also see L7 level metrics? And uh, if it is L3, L4 only, uh, then uh, will it be my primary observability, or will it be my default level observability? If nothing can capture, then EBVF captures. I don't know if I make sense. Uh. Yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. Uh, eBPF can be used for a lot of things, and it can also, it, it can even parse user space uh, logic as well. And it can also, uh, it's, uh, it's also possible to generate layer seven metrics, basically. So it, it's definitely possible. You just have to think about the most efficient way to, to do things. Um, and you also have to uh, take, uh, 
uh, maintainability into considerations. So if there are tools available that are that might not, not already use eBPF, uh, but are solving your pro problem, then it might make sense to, to use that for that purpose. But for example, let's say um, if you if you take monitoring as an example, uh, in the Prometheus ecosystem, Node Exporter is is the de facto standard to monitor host that can solve a lot of problems that you might already have. But for example, out of memory exceptions is a, is a program that it that it cannot. Uh, so it may it might make sense to use uh, eBPF for that one. Or let's say you cannot use Node Exporter for some reason, and you all, but you only need a subset of the features that um, that Node Exporter can provide. Then it's also possible to to write some eBPF code and uh, with covering those features that you are interested in so you can have a more lightweight and uh, efficient um, lightweight yeah um, node exporter based on eBPF if, if that's what you wish. Any more questions? Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Um, so you presented a lot of cases where you could use eBPF, but what would you, what would be the use case that you would uh, not, re where you would not recommend using eBPF? <laughs> oh, excellent question. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For example, there might be some cases where uh, security is taken quite seriously, and uh, running eBPF might require advanced privileges. Uh, there are improvements happening on this area as well, so there's currently a capability uh, that, is, that is aiming to provide the least necessary um, privileges that are needed to run eBPF code. Uh, so we are getting there, but uh, there are still uh, some security concerns, maybe, uh, that might raise some security eyebrows if you want to, to run uh, eBPF in those cases. Um, another example would be, might be, I'm not sure, um, but the, the, first que the, the previous question about layer 7 metrics, that's, that's basically solved with layer 7 components, for example, invoice proxies. If you're running a service mesh, you get observability out of box to cover all these metrics. Um, this can be solved with eBPF to some extent, but uh, for example, um, Envoy and the Steel sidecars are, are, are a great and well adopted uh, fit for this use case as well. I, I would talk mainly with eBPF, I would focus on really hard observability challenges because I think this is the area where uh, eBPF can shine. And if you have fine integration with, with the observability ecosystem, then ag again, it's, it's a great fit to, to solve these uh, challenges. Running little eBPF programs and exporting those as primitive metrics is, is quite lightweight and quite efficient. Um, the code for these logics is basically just, I don't know, 10, 20 lines of uh, C code, so it's, it's also not too hard to maintain. So I, I would say that's the uh, best uh, use case for eBPF, in my opinion. Thank you. Any more? Uh, we have one more question. Well, I'll take it then. Uh, I have one question. Uh, Christian, no, uh, one more. So I have, I have had the chance of try to play around with eBPF and try out maybe 20 or 21 of the most common 25 syscalls. Uh, and I saw that Bumblebee makes things a little bit easier preparing the framework for the type of program that I have to run. Uh, but still, I think it's a very steep learning curve and a very hard adoption for consumers of the tech. Does Solo plan to make it even easier than with Bumblebee? Yes, yeah, so for example, this is our product is using eBPF to some extent under the hood. For example, to accelerate the service mesh, uh, we are also generating metrics based on EB, uh, eBPF, and we are using uh, some part of the open source Bumblebee code in our product to, to do that. Uh, but we open source Bumblebee for this exact reason, to make it um, all easier. And uh, we are not 
yes, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's still not the, the best user experience and developer experience. That it's, it's quite steep still. But for example, on the roadmap, you can see that we want to uh, have, for example, better uh, and tighter Kubernetes integration. And that's, that's uh, for example, one area where uh, we still have some work to do. Operator is a great step in that direction. But being able to correlate to actual pod names uh, can all this make, uh, make, uh, make it uh, easier because without this, uh, you still to do some uh, user space plumbing on your own to, to get the actual data. So the answer is yes, we are still uh, working on improving uh, Bumblebee and it's open source. So if you have any idea or feature request, feel free to, to file a GitHub issue or even contribute to the project. It's, it's quite a small project still and it's, I think it's, it's one of the easiest way to get started with DBPS. So we are happy to um, onboard you to the open source project if you, if you are interested in that. Thank you very much, Christian. I'm sure that everyone uh, was very interested and no one dared to say that they were uh, eBPF experts. <laughs> um, thanks, Christian. Please give it up for Christian. We are going to have a little bit, uh, 20 minutes, 21 minutes break. Uh, we are going to start again.